hello um, good day my subscribers those who have been subscribing to my channel those who have um, been following me up those who have encouraged me in one way or the other today I'm going to explain um, something very important about fuelless generator as you all know the fuelless generator we know um, it is a removal of the mechanical aspect of it so today I'm going to share with you one of the top secrets one of the top secrets why electric motors or DC motor behave the way they behave why they draw more current why they draw more amps this video is a practical video please watch till the end so you can understand everything everything practically everything about electric motors and about dc motors please don't skip any video watch till the end his name is peter lindemann is one of my mentors and um i wish to share this with my subscribers so they can see the effect of um electric motor without wasting much time let's dive into the video but before we go please do subscribe and press the bell notification to see more videos. Hello, my name is Peter Lindemann. Welcome to Electric Motor Secrets. I've been fascinated with electric motors and generators for more than 30 years. In that time, I've studied this subject extensively. I've also built and tested hundreds of experimental models. What I'd like to share with you today are the findings of that 30-year study. But before we go into the lab and hit the books, let me give you a little bit of history. If you were under 40 years of age, you probably missed out on electric motor shop in college. That's because in the 1970s, most of the major universities in the United States closed their motor labs to make room for the new computer science departments. Since electric motor design had not changed in the last 50 years, it was reasonable to believe that it wouldn't change in the future. So there is no longer any reason to give new students hands-on experience with these machines when one semester of book study would suffice. But remarkably, in the 1990s, motor design did start changing again. Big breakthroughs came on a number of fronts. First, the cost of the superpowerful neodymium iron boron permanent magnets dropped dramatically. This made it possible to build motors that were smaller and more powerful for their size. Next, high-speed brushless electronic commutation methods were developed and perfected. This allowed the sparking commutator to be eliminated in all DC motor designs. Even the idea of superconducting wires was revived. So, electric motor efficiency was on the rise again. Today, fractional horsepower DC electric motors are approaching 95% efficiency. This is a range of performance once left only to Tesla's three-phase AC induction motors above 50 horsepower. These new motors are so small, powerful, and lightweight that they have all but taken over in the model airplane field from the little gas engines. So, what's left to do? Is there only one or two more percent efficiency left to wring out of these designs before the electric motor reaches the pinnacle of its development? Actually, the answer is no. Tremendous improvements in electric motor performance have already been proved by a number of inventors. To bring you up to speed on these developments, I'm going to focus on three main topics. These are, one, the true function of the back EMF in electric motors. Two, alternatives to direct induction for the production of motor torque. And three, methods of recovering some of the electrical energy input. To do this, I have to lay a little bit of boring groundwork so everyone can follow along. So please bear with me if you know some of this stuff already. We'll get to the good stuff soon. The study of electric motor efficiency requires the use of a dynamometer or something that can measure the mechanical energy output. For those of you who don't know, the dynamometer is a calibrated braking mechanism invented by a French mathematician and engineer named Gaspard de Prony in 1821. Even today, small dynamometers are still quite often referred to as a de Prony brake. So let's go into the lab, build a dynamometer, and use it to test an electric motor. Then we can see exactly what it does and why. Here's how it's done. If we want to understand how to measure the efficiency of electric motors, 
we have to be able to measure the mechanical output. For that, we need a dynamometer. Now, they don't build small dynamometers for small motors, so we have to build our own. So what we're going to need is a wheel of known circumference, a leather strap, two spring scales, a tachometer, a voltmeter, an amp meter, and a calculator. Let's see what this looks like. The first thing you need is a wheel of known circumference. In this case, we have machined this one so it's exactly one foot in circumference. And you need to have it to uh, have a hole and a set screw in there so you can attach it to your motor. And every time it turns around, then we will have a calibrated length or distance that it's traveled. So the first thing you need is a wheel. The next thing you need is something to create a resistance against that wheel, and in this case we have used a thin strip of soft leather. That, uh, and we've put a hole in each end of this so we can attach our spring scales to it. So the next thing you need is a, a small piece of soft leather. The next thing you need are two spring scales. And these are calibrated, small spr calibrated spring scales that you can buy at uh, Edmund Scientific or a number of other different kind of scientific uh, supply stores. And these are adjustable so that you can um, uh, get these to be relatively accurate. So you need two spring scales. The next thing you need is a tachometer, something that's going to measure how fast your motor is turning when you take the measurements of the resistance to turning it. So you're going to need a tachometer. You will also need to uh, measure the volts and amps uh, going into the motor so we can understand how much electricity we are using to drive the motor. So this will measure our inputs. So you need a voltmeter and an amp meter. And finally you'll need a calculator, something that we can take all of these numbers that we have taken and uh, run them through an algebraic equation to determine the efficiency of the motor. So again, this is what you'll need. A wheel of known circumference, a piece of leather, two spring scales, a tachometer, a voltmeter and an amp meter, and a calculator. And from these, we can build our own dynamometer. Okay, here we are in, with our setup. We have the power supply driving the motor with our wheel attached, and we're going to run the dyno test. Now, what we're going to have to do to do this is we're going to have to take four measurements simultaneously. We're going to have to read the volts and the current, while we also read the RPM and the deflection on the spring scales. So here, let me show you as we do this, what this is going to look like. Got the spring scales here. I'm going to wrap the spring scales around here. And what's happening is, is that you can see, maybe you can see, maybe you can't see, but that the, the one in the back deflects down, whereas the other one is relieved because it's, it's turning in that direction. So the, the front scale is still sitting at zero, but the back scale is, is reading about 600 grams deflection. And as you can see, it slows down and the current draw rises. So you can get an idea of what's happening here. You can tell the motor slowing down because the sound changes. You can see that the current rises. So we're going to take all of these measurements simultaneously to get an idea of the efficiency of the motor. So here's another shot of the dyno test showing that there's almost no deflection on the front spring and about 700 grams on the back. You can see how much it's pulled the back spring down and how much it's relieving this one. It's still sitting basically at zero. Okay, so let's take some measurements and see what we get. We'll put the strap with the spring scales on. And you can see where I've got them. I'm holding them both with one hand. And I've got the tachometer here, and I'm going to shine my spot on here. 
and I'm going to bring the current up to 7 amps, right like that, and there's my readings, 1864, about 1868, I have a deflection on the scales of 700 grams, and there's my readings before my strap gets too hot, like a break. So you have to take all four measurements simultaneously, and now we can calculate. Okay, so here are the measurements we saw on the bench. Um, our input was 12.1 uh, volts at 7 amps, and that comes to a total of 84.7 watts input. We know that one horsepower is 746 watts, so when we divide our uh, our measurement here, 84.7 watts by 746 watts per horsepower, we get uh, that our electrical input was the equivalent of 0.1135 horsepower. Our outputs were measured as 1864 RPM and 700 grams of deflection on our spring scales. Now the first thing we have to do is convert these two quantities to what we need and we're going to measure the horsepower mechanically in foot-pounds per second. So we have to first convert the RPM into feet per second. So we know that our wheel is one foot in circumference, so one revolution equals one foot. So uh, RPM is revolutions per minute, so if we divide that by 60 seconds per minute, we get revolutions per second. And for our wheel, revolutions per second equals feet per second. So we can take our RPM, 1864, divide by 60, and get 31.06 feet per second. The second thing we must do is convert grams into pounds. One pound equals 454 grams. And we measured 700 grams, so when we divide that by 454 grams per pound, we get 1.54 pounds. So continuing, we take our 31.06 feet per second, multiply that times 1.54 pounds, and we get our total mechanical measured output at 47.88 foot-pounds per second. So we know that one horsepower equals 550 foot-pounds per second, so when we divide this, we get our total measured mechanical output at 0 .087 horsepower. Efficiency equals output divided by input. So here are our outputs and inputs, and when we divide these quantities, we get this uh, fraction, 0.767. We multiply that times 100, so we get our measured efficiency of 76.7%. Not bad for a one-tenth horsepower motor test. Okay. You just saw me demonstrate the dynamometer test. You may have noticed that it's pretty hard to take all four measurements simultaneously by hand. Obviously, I could have gotten a more accurate measurement if the spring scales were hanging from a fixed bracket with a preset tension. Then it would be simple to speed the motor up to the point where the front spring scale read zero and all the tension was on the back spring scale. An RPM reading could be taken with the tachometer at this point, with all the values remaining stable for accurate recording. But right now, I'm just trying to demonstrate the fundamental effects, so precision measuring is not absolutely required. If you were watching closely, you might have thought that the current reading was slightly higher than 7 amps. But for our purposes, the numbers I'm using are adequate, and our calculations are pretty close. So let's go back into the lab and explore some more of the other behaviors of our direct induction electric motor. Okay, in this experiment, we have this uh, power supply dialing up just with a half a volt and a little over a half an amp and all I'm trying to do is show the polarity of the applied voltages and the speed and the generating and the motoring action. So we can clearly see that this motor is turning in this direction when we apply the, the proper polarity to it based on its own wiring uh, 
um, schematic. In other words, it wants positive to the red wire and negative to the black wire and it will turn in this direction. I'm going to disconnect this. And I'm going to hook the meter up with the exact same polarities. And I hope you can see this, this meter. Now I'm going to turn this in exactly the same direction as we did when we hooked it to the power supply. And what you see is it looks like it's generating a voltage in the same polarity. You see that? that this is a positive value on the meter. If I turn it in the opposite direction, immediately the minus sign comes up. Okay? So what does this mean? In other words, when I turn it in the same direction that it turns, it looks like it's generating a voltage that adds to it. But the fact is, is now this is acting as the source and the negative is coming out the black wire and the positive is coming out the red wire, whereas when it was hooked up to the power supply, it was exactly the opposite. The negative was going in the black wire. So actually what this shows is when, it, when I turn it in the same direction, it is actually generating in the opposite. It's generating the voltage in opposition to, it's trying to feed it back out whereas before we were feeding it back in. So I just want you to understand that when it turns in one direction, it motors, but it generates in opposition to itself. This is another experimental setup that I've put together for this educational video. It consists of two identical permanent magnet DC electric motors. One of them will be run as an, as an electric motor from our power supply. The other one will be run as an electric generator turned through this shaft coupler. Here's our next setup. We have the power supply, again, connected to the small drive motor. It's mechanically driving the second drive motor to be run as a generator. And then we'll be looking at the the voltage generated by the second motor on this meter here. So I'm going to turn this on and we're going to use this demonstration to explore the activities going on inside these motors. We saw in the other demonstration when we did the uh, dynamometer test that when we mechanically loaded the motor to pull the to get our measurements we noticed that the current reading went up now many people believe who have not studied these things that that is caused by the back emf actually that is not what's happening and to understand what the back emf is doing in these motors and generators i've set up this little demonstration what I'm going to do is I'm going to dial up um, enough voltage here to run this at 4 volts. These are little 12 volt motors and I don't want to overload them. So I'm, I'm turning this one as the motor and using uh, 4 volts and it's drawing about 3 amps. So this total situation here is about 12 watts, it's a low amount. And all I'm trying to do here is we're not trying to do any efficiency tests or anything else as far as power production. But I want to show you what the back EMF is and how it works. Now, the reason you can't build a self-sustaining combination of a motor and a generator using this type of equipment, this is what's called um, a direct induction machine, it has a permanent magnet field, and it works equally well as a motor and as a generator. So here, this one I'm using as a motor, this one I'm using as a generator, and I want to show you what's going on. Inside this one, it's working as a generator 
in opposition to its motoring activity. And this is what is called the back EMF. In other words, depending on how fast it's going, it's generating a voltage. And we can see that by just running this one, we're not drawing any power out of it, so we're not creating any load, but we just want to look at the voltage that it's generating. I have these two directly coupled, and they're the same exact style motor. So we can be pretty sure that if this one is generating a minus 3.18 volts at this speed, that this one is also producing 3.18 volts inside of the armature that is in opposition to the four volts that we are applying. This, both of these machines generate voltage in direct relationship to the speed. So you can see on this meter, which is now creeping up to, as, it, as the bearings warm up and it's able to get a, a turn a little bit faster, we can see that the generated voltage is rising slightly. That's because the speed is rising slightly for the same amount of applied energy. So that's typical of these types of motors. Now what I want to show you is exactly what causes these effects to happen. Many people believe that when you load the motor, the the mechanical drag is what causes it to draw more energy. But actually, what's happening is, is that as you load the motor, it's turning slower. As it turns slower, it generates less reverse voltage, and it then draws more current because the resistance that it's going through with less reverse voltage simply draws more current. Many of you haven't studied these things, and here's a perfectly good book called Basic Electricity. This was developed by the Navy to teach new recruits the, the new science of electricity and electronics in the 1950s. In, in the back of this book, there's a section on electric motors, and here is the page where they talk about counter electromotive force. And you can see in this diagram here, here's a north pole, here's a south pole, and you have a winding that goes through it. And the diagram shows basically you have the resistance of the armature winding, and the counter EMF is shown as a battery, something that can generate a voltage, in opposition to the applied voltage. So you can see through the commutator brushes. So you can see that as this turns faster and faster, this applied volt, this counter EMF is generated, which, which opposes the applied voltage. This is what causes the current to drop through the fixed resistance of the armature winding. So actually, the counter EMF, or the back EMF in a motor like this, is actually what causes the current to drop to its lowest possible um, value when the motor is unloaded. So it's the back EMF that causes the motor to have a very, very low idle current when it's unloaded. As it's loaded, it slows down, generates less back EMF, and draws more current, which makes the motor stronger. This is a wonderful setup because it makes these motors, it makes them uh, self-regulating. Notice if I slow it down at all, it starts drawing more current over here. I've got it up to four, four amps here, and you can see that the amount of voltage at this speed that it's generating is down to 2.85. But I let it go back up to speed, and it generates more. If I slow it down at all, it generates less counter voltage and draws more current. So this is how these motors work. This is how the back EMF works in the motor mode.
So this is completely understandable and it's standard uh, right out of the books as, we, as I showed in the section from basic electro electricity. Now, by calling this back EMF, it tends to obscure what it is. And what I want you to see is, is that the back EMF, when this thing is driving as a motor, the back EMF is really just the reverse direction generated voltage. Back EMF. EMF stands for electromotive force. So really what the back EMF here is the reverse direction generated voltage. Okay? And you can see it. The reverse direction generated voltage. And this is created simply because of the speed that this thing runs. This thing is turning as a motor because current is moving through it. But it will generate the reverse voltage simply because it's turning at a particular speed. Now when we turn this around, let's look at the generator side. If we ask this, Right now, there's no, there's no real current moving in this. We're just looking at the voltage that's generated. But now if we actually ask it to generate some current, okay, I'm going to ask it to light up this little light bulb a little bit, you can see that it draws more current here. And you can hear it slow down. You can hear the tone change. Okay, And as it slows down, it generates less reverse voltage. You understand? So here, now the current is moving in it, it's starting to motor. It's starting to motor against itself in the opposite direction. So when the machine is running as a generator, we'll call the back EMF the reverse direction motor torque. When it's running as a motor, we will call the back EMF the reverse direction generated voltage. So what you can see now is that this is exactly the same machine. And you can bias which effect you're looking for. If you actually force current through it, like from our power supply, it motors ahead. And the, and the motoring effect gets ahead of the reverse generation. In this situation where we're mechanically forcing it to turn, the generation effects get ahead of the reverse motoring effects and therefore it will push electricity out of the system to light external loads.